Hello, and welcome to FACT's webinar called Introduction to Raising Mangalitsa Pigs. Our guest presenters are Carla Martz and Michelle Anderson. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating the session. Thank you for joining us. So let me take just a minute to do a few quick introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust Our Facts. We are a national nonprofit organization that's headquartered in Illinois. We work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a healthy and humane manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers like yourselves, promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and by helping consumers make informed food choices. You might be familiar with my uh, colleague, my fact colleague, uh, Samantha Gasson. We run uh, FACTS Humane Farming Program and we work directly with livestock and poultry farmers from all across the country. We offer grants, scholarships, training courses, mentorship, and of course, webinars on many fascinating topics. So please visit our website at foodanimalconcernstrust.org to learn more about our farmer services. So this time I'm very pleased to introduce our guest presenters, Carla Mertz with Iron Shoe Farm and Michelle Anderson with Little Curly Pig Farm. We are very lucky to have them both with us today to share their expertise about raising Mangalitsa pigs. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Carla, and I will pull up your slides. Take it away. Good morning, everyone. So let me just switch um, over. No, you're good. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Carla Mertz, um, co-hosting with Michelle Anderson, um, where we're going to talk about uh, raising the marvelous Mangalitsa. Um, so a little bit about myself and my family, um, how we got started in our venture. Um, we uh, started our farm in 2013. We actually um, went through a health scare with my daughter when she was three years old. Um, she had rotavirus, which is a gastrobacterial infection. Um, nearly passed away from that, but the results of that was that we had to teach her small body how to eat. Um, and consume food all over again, which meant we were growing our own vegetables in a small city lot um, in a rural town of Zimmerman, Minnesota. Um, then learning more about sourcing meat locally and um, a goal of myself and my husband's was to have a small farm and raise our own produce. And um, from there we, we purchased our farm 2013. We're located in uh, Sherburne County, which is in central Minnesota, um, right outside of the St. Cloud area. And for the past six years, we have been raising Hereford beef, Mangalitsa hogs, uh, growing microgreens, having events on the farm, and really bringing that local advocacy program um, to the state of Minnesota, um, talking about sustainability and local food access. Um, so we, we pride ourselves on being, um, you know, a direct market for just the consumer and then growing into selling to restaurants and the wholesale industry as well. And now I'll turn it over to Michelle. All right. Thanks, you guys. I really appreciate you guys all taking the time to listen to us this morning. Um, my name is Michelle Anderson. Um, we with my husband and my daughter Lillian, um, moved to a former dairy farm in Hamburg, Minnesota, um, almost 11 years ago. And our Mangalitsa adventure was actually quite a bit of an accident, to be honest. We were looking for just a couple of beef cattle just to raise on our own. And the farm we went to look at that had the Scottish Highlands we were interested in, um, had just had a litter of piglets and she asked if I wanted to see them. And I had never heard of a Mangalitsa. I'd never seen one. I had no clue what they even were. And I took one look at it and not quite sure what still possessed me to do this, but I put down on a deposit on a breeding pair. And here we are six years later. Um, 
it's just been a crazy wild ride of an adventure, but um, we are Pharaoh to finish. So we are in control of every single step of the way of the meat that we produce. Um, we are um, direct to consumer. Um, so direct sales to the farm. Um, I think my slide disappeared. I can just keep talking. Um, so yeah, we are mainly direct sales um, from the farm. So custom halves, holes, um, individual cuts. Um, I think my slide had a thing on it though. So I need to see it. There we go. Okay. Um, we are solely purebred mangalitsas. So we do not do any crossbreeding. We are only um, mangalitsas. Um, we are members of MBOR, which is um, the brand spanking new um, breed registry, which I will briefly mention towards the end of um, the presentation. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much us in a nutshell. And basically my husband, I and daughter are the, we run the whole show. So All right, breed history. Um, this, I could probably talk about an entire webinar about this, um, but we'll keep it kind of just brief. Um, the breed's been around um, in some way or another since roughly 1833. They originated, originated in mostly in Eastern Europe, um, Austria, Hungary, um, Romania. Um, they weren't formally recognized as a distinct breed until roughly 1927. Um, they were highly prized actually as a lard breed because of their fat um, because back in that time period fat was more highly utilized um, than it is today um, but as obviously wars went through and um, the culture shifted and changed um, that demand for that fat and a breed like the mangalitsa fell by the wayside significantly um, so by the 70s there was I don't want to say they almost became extinct, um, but they were definitely on their way out. Um, and so they, a group um, in Hungary actually worked to bring the breed back. Um, so they are, you know, they're all over the world. They didn't come to the U.S. until roughly 2007. Um, but they, um, like I said, we could probably spend an entire webinar on just the history alone of this breed. Um, yeah, that's, I'll just leave it at that. I know people are going to have questions, but I'll just kind of leave it, leave it at the basic and um, leave it right there. So, Oops. so the breed itself, um, they're a lard breed, as I mentioned. So that photo up that you see, um, the x-ray, the one on the right side um, is similar to what you would see on a mangalitsa. Um, so they have obviously a much larger um, layer of fat, um, which benefits them in many ways. Um, we are located in Minnesota, obviously. So winters for them are no problem. Um, 20 to 30 below, they are outside napping in the sun. Um, so they are very, very tolerant of cold. Um, the flip side of that is that your summers will get challenging because of all that fat and pigs don't have a large amount of sweat glands. So they have a very hard time cooling down. Um, so while the lard breed is made for the winter, the summers, you need to make sure they have plenty of shade, plenty of water, wallows. We do fans. We have each area on our farm kind of has a different setup based on where they are. Um, woods, just natural trees, that kind of thing. Um, their main distinct thing, you know, is their woolly coat. They look like sheep. Um, we had neighbors that drove by our farm for six months arguing whether we had sheep or pigs. And finally they stopped in and met them and saw that they were in fact pigs. Um, so they're slower growing. So um, the average commercial hog will take roughly six months to get to about 300 pounds. A mangalitsa will take at least twice that. Um, so they come in three main colors that you'll see in the US, um, the swallow belly, which is usually black on top, white on the belly. Um, you will see a variation that can be bred into this that is black on top and red on the belly. Um, the red, um, which my friend Christina <laughs> raises up in Canada, and the blonde. Um, the black mangalitsas were also um, in existence, but were declared extinct 
Um, they actually have been brought back um, by the magic of science, um, but are only currently in Hungary. I don't know if we'll ever see those here in the US, unfortunately. So this is a picture um, found by, um, on this, I credited the photo to the gentleman. This is what, it, it's just a black mangalitsa. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, there's lots of info on how they resuscitated this and brought this back um, from the dead, I guess. It's no other way to say it. So they're just, they're incredible. Carla, I'll let you talk, talk like port huts. <laughs> That's good. So um, as you can see, we're located in Minnesota. Um, we have a lot of open pasture. Um, you can see this is actually of Michelle's farm in open space. Um, but there are several types of different ways that you can raise this breed type of hog. You don't have to have it in a complete enclosed pen. Um, we have done everything from putting them in a pen structure. And then um, off of that, this year, we're actually going into what's called a wagon wheel design. So we have a central feed hub that then goes and does an offshoot to four separate pen areas. Um, but the key is, is to have a solid structure, um, no matter what. These guys do tend to root. Um, they, they're, that's just a natural instinct for pigs in general. Um, they will look for those grubs and worms in the soil and try and find the cool spot, like Michelle was saying, in the summertime. Um, in the lower left-hand photo, you'll see we have a picture of a piglet uh, next to that hog panel. And this first year that we raised these wonderful pigs, um, we decided to do a wood shelter with metal top. Um, it wasn't super successful. So knowing that they chewed on the wood, um, they actually like literally shoved themselves right through the side panel and blew out the front end of the hut. Um, and we were looking at it as a, you know, how can we be sustainable and use product on the farm that we already had and not spend a lot of money? Um, and then they end up rotting. Uh, they end up, you know, climbing on top of things and smashing the roof in. So it was just not very successful. So then in turn, we um, found Porta Hut. They're actually made in Storm Lake, Iowa. Uh, went down with my F-350, picked up, picked up about six of them and brought them all the way back. Um, but they're a wonderful structure. Um, they're not a sponsor to this, but just saying something of this uh, caliber is really great. They provide shade. They have a farrowing system that you can put into the interior of it. Works super great in winter seasons, and they have a multitude of sizes. So we have um, the smaller size hut, which is approximately a six by nine. Um, and literally all of our hogs, we have 10 of them right now, they all go into the same hut, um, no matter what, and they barrow and sleep on top of each other and all that fun stuff. Michelle, on the other hand, has a couple different sizes. Um, and, you know, looking at the price point of these, I can do my own structure for $250 or order these guys for, you know, three to $500. Um, the larger ones are, are more into the, you know, thousands, but they're well worth the investment. Um, and when we're talking about bedding, um, it's kind of crucial to have something in play, whether it's straw, but we've found personally that um, with breakdown and just keeping these hogs busy during the winter month, that corn stock bales work really well. And they're actually a fraction of the cost of straw. Straw is getting very expensive where we are. Um, it's almost, you know, seven to $10 a small square, whereas these round bales are far more cost effective. Plus it keeps them engaged and playful and they nest really well with, with those straw bales. Um, we can go to the next slide which kind of leads us into fencing. So going off of those panels, um, we've done a couple different variations of electric and uh, hog panels um, and roll fence. 
So our keynote is that the standard hog fence, which is your two foot high, um, two to three foot high panel just isn't tall enough. These guys can climb, um, even though they're a large breed of hog. Um, we do get, we've had escapees, um, you know, they just jump over the fence or bulldoze right through it. Um, so doing something of just a wood paneled structure um, might not be the best solution. Um, but with that said, on the top left picture, we, we dig our posts down pretty far. We go with an eight foot hog panel at times, depending on where we are um, on our plot. Um, but the key is that we found that even the cattle sizing works really well with another barrier roll fence on the outside of that. So it keeps the piglets in. Um, they do tend to roam. The center picture you see is a product from Premier One. It's a roll fence. Um, this is actually solar powered. The thing that we found, um, we raise a crossbreed as well. So we have both peers and then Red Waddle crossed with. Manga and this photo, we have a mangalitsa in the back, and then our red wattles are towards the front. And the wattles stayed in just fine. Um, they felt the zap um, on their hide and on their nose really well. But with the mangalitsa, they tended to um, not feel that shock just as much because they have so much insulation with not only their hide, but their fat content. So they didn't feel it as much and they would just uproot and go right underneath it. So for us, it worked much better um, to do more of this roll fence tied in with hot panels. <clears throat> so you can go to the next slide. All right, feed. This is, I could talk about feed all day long. So the main thing with, and really any animal, but especially the mangalitsa, what you put into your pig is what you're going to get out of it. If you feed it garbage, it's the pork is going to taste like garbage. Um, ours are raised on a custom blend, um, which I have in the photo there. Um, it's mainly barley based, um, but ours is soy free. And you'll hear lots of different arguments go back and forth about, um, soy being bad and corn being bad. And I think a lot of it is they're all protein sources. So, I mean, realistically it's, I think it's just a personal preference on the farmer's end. Um, I personally choose not to put soy. I have a couple of customers that are allergic. Um, and I, we've just had such wonderful luck on the feed that we have that I just have left it out of there. Um, we feed corn. Um, it's mainly a treat. Um, so it's whole corn or we get, um, field corn on the cob. That's another thing they kind of like that'll keep them busy um, and entertained, um, especially during the winter months when it's cold and there's nothing interesting to do. Um, so yeah, you can kind of look down the list of our feed and just kind of see what we feed. It's a 16% protein base. Um, and we have, this is a term that I haven't a lot of people don't know what it is. And I don't know if it's just a Midwest thing, but um, you'll see on that list, it says trans. Um, it's basically what is called transitional. Um, so it's farms that are converting from conventional to organic practices. And there is a time period that is required for them to convert so they can still raise crops on it, but they can't officially deem them organic um, until a certain point. And so those crops are referred to as transitional. So I don't push that my feed is organic because no offense to any, I just, I don't care. So I would rather it more be local and sourced and just, I know where, it, know where it's coming from. So that trans on there, that's what that refers to. It's transitional grains. Um, and like I said, ours is a 16% protein base. Um, we feed our grain year round. Um, so we supplement with pasture as available. Um, and local orchards that supply us with um, ground apples and pumpkins and even our neighbors, we get all kinds of garden produce donations all year round. Um, so obviously pigs are, or should be strictly vegetarians. Um, I won't even get into what feeding meat to an animal will do. So just don't do it. Um, <laughs> but um, basically, even if you raise them on pasture, they still need a supplemental feed to ensure they get 
the vitamins, vitamins and minerals, they need to balance their own diet and keep them healthy. Um, and also to produce the high quality pork and fat that these pigs are famous for. Um, so if you, you know, if you want to get out of these, what everybody talks about, you need to actually care what goes into them. So next slide. Carla, I'll let you do processing. This is my, my, my near and dear to my heart. Um, naturally, <laughs> I'm, I'm a meat cutting nerd only because we, we have such great relationships with chefs in the Twin Cities and what cuts they're specifically looking for. Um, <clears throat> so kind of going back to that finishing size, um, like Michelle said, we also are a Faro to finish um, we are butchering at about 14 months, um, on our farm. And even with our crossbreed, um, we finish them all out at about 300 pounds live weight. If they get any larger than that, it's really difficult for the processor to handle that large of a hog. Um, and it also, um, some of our customers like to have these smoked, so to keep that size in check is really important. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple different things that we do in the state of Minnesota as far as custom versus inspected. So Minnesota has a program for both, cu both custom exempt, uh, Minnesota state inspected, which is similar or equivalent to USDA processing. Um, so if we have a Minnesota equal to or USDA, then that means we can sell off the farm to a wholesaler, another packer, food group, uh, restaurant, school, you name it. Um, the cool thing with this is um, being able to know your cuts and getting educated with your processor and saying, do not take any of my fat off of this pig. And I can't stress that enough. Um, you'll see by the cuts in the upper right hand photo, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the amount of fat that this hog has can generate anywhere from 50 to 70% of your animal, um, depending on what you want that end goal to be. We try and aim for about 60% because we want the marbling to look very similar to that Wagyu or Kobe beef. That's the end goal. Um, we always leave a, a nice, beautiful fat cap on our pork chops um, that about a one to two inch fat cap is our general consensus. Um, and you'll see by that carcass that's hanging in the bottom uh, right hand corner, that is your standard mangalitsa carcass on the exterior before they even cut into it. Um, so if your butcher is questioning you, uh, they really shouldn't be. They need to be educated on cutting this animal. We're really, really lucky in the respect that the U of M Extension, the Extension Sciences Office with Ryan Cox knows this animal. So he can go in and teach students um, in their meat sciences lab that this is meant to be a fatty hog. Um, so uh, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so Michelle will probably pop in and talk a little bit about some of these things as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. But you really want to know um, how to price your pork. This is really important. So knowing what your bottom line expenses are, um, we're all in a niche market with this type of a hog. It's a boutique item. Um, yes, you can commercially uh, have this be supported in the industry, um, but many of us are small farm and we do a small amount of animals. But with that said, you have to know your inputs. Um, you have to know that your cost of feed, knowing that this animal takes about a year um, my price point for my grain might be different than yours because we source ours from a local feed mill. We're not producing our own grains. Um, and right there on feed costs alone, labor, um, excluding processing, my cost per hog is $1,200. So at minimum for me to break even, I need to get that price point um, from my customer. Um, too far often we're seeing people merely market these animals really low 
um, just to offload them. And that's really not, um, it's not respectful of the, of the breed type of pig that we're raising. So you'll see um, a lot of niche market. This animal is also very sought after for charcuterie sausage making. Um, in Hungary, it's, you'll see a plethora of markets. Um, it's a farmer's market stand after stand after stand full of sausage, rendered lard, smoked lard, cured lard, you name it. And it really pays a great homage to this breed. There's actually a festival that they hold um, every year uh, during the month of February, I believe it is. And it just pays great tribute to um, the proteins that come off of this hog. And it's by far the best fat that you can get on the marketplace. Um, again, it's what this hog is known for. So we do rendered lard through an inspection process in the state of Minnesota to be able to sell. We sell that in the pint pound. Um, and we also sell whole lard for those that want to render it themselves um, or even soap making. Um, but Michelle, I can let you kind yeah, of. Yeah, somebody, I, somebody had posted a question. What, what to do with all this fat? Um, <laughs> oh boy, the list. Oh, Carla mentioned people make soap out of it, candles. Um, the main, like she mentioned the lard, we actually sell our fat um, in, in kind of, I call it multiple grades, even though fat isn't really graded, but um, I have um, Russian and Ukrainian customers that want the thickest back fat cuts they can possibly get. So I refer to that as my lardo grade fat um, because they cure it. And um, all, it's, that's kind of a deal all over Europe. So it just kind of depends on length of time. They each have their own recipes, their own traditions. Um, several of those pictures are from customers of mine, um, the one with the loaf of bread and the tomatoes. Um, he is my, one of my best fat customers. And, um, as you can see the one it's got, I believe it's probably paprika on it. Um, they want those thick back fat pieces, um, to cure it. And basically they spread it on bread and they, and he eat it. And it's fantastic. Um, another fat picture down there, um, towards the left side that looks like, I'm not sure exactly how to explain it, but, um, that's another version of, um, more of an Italian lardo um, that was sliced very cold on a meat slicer and you put it on crackers or bread and it is absolutely divine. And it's when somebody first told me that's what they do with fat, I thought they were crazy and then I tasted it. And yeah, and if you know, you know, it's just, it's, you have to experience it to believe it because it's just that amazing. Um, but it's, I need to mention that it's just as important to find yourself a fat market as it is a meat market. Selling pork chops are easy. Anybody will buy those. Um, but finding a market for your fat is equally as important because it's almost, you know, like Carla mentioned, it's going to be about 40 to 50% of your, um, of your output on your animal. We actually are, I'm just going to pop in here, a couple questions that came in um, in the Q&A that might be good to answer you know, related to this slide. Um, so folks are wondering, how many pounds of grain a day would you feed your pigs each? I'll say what we do. Um, we do five pounds per pig per day. That's kind of yep. the general rule That's for so raising true. hogs in general. Um, and then everything else, like like Michelle, we give apples and we also do corn and um, some other added things just to keep them busy. Um, it's more of a treat than anything. Um, we do supplement that in. We also supplement in, um, we'll give them spent grain from a local brewery that contacts us. Um, it doesn't actually change any of the flavor because we're not doing it as a sole feed source. It's again, more like a treat. Um, it's a byproduct that we have access to. We also feed it to our cattle. So they get maybe 30 pounds of it out of that vat like once a month. So for us, we do the five pounds per, per day. Um, I see the question on feed cost. We personally buy um, bulk. We have uh, one ton bulk totes. Um, our processor um, for feed, um, it's about 
three to four hundred dollars, depending on the price of corn at that particular time um, per ton. So we we also have it's a mix. So like Michelle, there's there's barley and other minerals and additives in with that feed. Um, so again, knowing when you're working with your customer, we always do a deposit. Um, on our animals before we go to market. So we ask for a reserve. Um, the customer pays us actually that amount of feed um, it takes to feed that animal. So we get um, anywhere from a $250 to $300 deposit from that customer. And it's kind of like a CSA where they know that they are pre-buying that animal and that helps us offset our feed costs in the beginning. So that's more of a business sales tactic for us that we utilize um, to create loyalty within our customer base uh, moving forward. Awesome. Um, and then quickly, uh, someone's wondering who, Carla, you use for processing. Good question. Um, I can talk Isaac, about that if yeah. you want. <laughs> hey, Zeke, I know. Um, local. So we utilized a few different processors depending on needs from our customers. Um, so when we go custom exempt or Minnesota equal to inspection, we utilize, they're called Grand Champion Meats out of Foley. Um, in the state of Minnesota, it is extremely hard to find scalding. Um, less and less processors are doing that because of the expense associated with the um, machine. Um, so it we even were using um, a processor in Richmond, Minnesota. They were state inspected, doing all of our render guard, and they have a scalder, but we aren't working with them anymore because they lost butchers, so they're short-staffed. Um, but they are also Minnesota state inspected. It's Plantenberg's. Um, they're one of the few and then for USDA processing, um, there's Dover meats in the Rochester area. Um, we can also speak with uh, Prairie meats in Olivia, Minnesota. Um, and then we've also worked with a couple other locations in the state. And I would highly encourage you to just go and visit as many butchers and call as many butchers and have a discussion over the phone and go tour their facility, look at their cleanliness, talk to them about what they offer. Um, and even if the, the hog is for your own personal use, you can go in alongside with them and, and see how they're cutting your animal. Um, it's really important because we work all work really, really hard on getting those cuts back that we want. So um, establishing that relationship is really important. Um, I actually have a customer that gets his specially cut for his charcuterie projects and he will come in and basically tell Matt um, at Taylor Meats in Watertown, that's where all of ours go, um, what he wants. And it's just, it's been a fantastic relationship and it's just great for that customer to be able to see it right then and there. I mean, there's no questions. It's, they get what they want and it's, yeah, it's great. So there's a follow-up question um, recommending hogs scalding and burning or skinning. Um, these hogs have a very coarse hair. It's very coarse. So even when um, the hog is scalded, there'll still be leftover hair fibers in the, in the skin um, that are attached. And so there's kind of a, a two-step to that. So our, our processors would have to go in and scald and then also take the torch and then go over the, the um, skin to get that excess um, off. And some processors didn't really like us in the beginning because they had to do that. And others learned that it was just part of the breed type, um, knowing that they have to do that. Um, let me just ask you this one more question before we move on, just because it's kind of related is someone's asking if you can talk um, a little bit about how the Mangalitsa lard is different from the other breeds. There's actually a whole bunch of information in the yeah. Q&A that <laughs> is really helpful as well for folks to reference. 
I can talk a little bit about it, Carla. Um, yeah. on, a, on a basic level, um, Mangalitsa fat is mainly their, their main claim to fame is their monounsaturated fat. So, which is actually a healthy fat. Um, so your different and your fat actually will vary too, if depending on what you're feeding, um, not nutritionally, but just quality wise. Um, so those mono monounsaturated fats are what you're going to, um, and honestly, I honestly tell people that from a nutrition standpoint, and even from a taste standpoint, I, I'm not, I didn't like fat. Like I would cut it off my pork chops. I cut it off my beef. I just, cause it was always heavy and, and it was just kind of gross. And honestly, once mango eats a fat, it's just, it's so much cleaner. Um, it doesn't leave that heavy residue in your mouth. Um, the mouthfeel on it is just completely different from even commercial pork. Um, and it's high in omega three and six, you know, fatty acid. I mean, it's just, it's fantastic. So it just, it's totally, I could get a lot more into the nutrition. We could spend a whole session on just that too, but, um, the monounsaturated fats are the big claim to fame for, um, the mangalitsa fat. There's, there's almost like a, so on ours, we get the comment made of it's, it's so sugary and melty. And when you have a pork chop, it cooks up or kind of crisps up like bacon on the outer edge. So true. And, and it's delicious. It's almost to the point of where I leave the fat to the end because it's so savory. It has so much flavor to it. Um, but yeah, it's, it definitely, definitely has more omega-3 fatty acids than salmon. So if you think about it that way, commodity pork isn't like that because it goes back to what you're feeding them. Well, um, there is another, yeah, I guess I'll ask this, this quick one right now before we move on is someone's in Florida and they're wondering if there's, um, you know, it, due to the heat and humid, humidity of that, of that area, is, is it possible to raise these, this breed down there? Absolutely. Yeah. We, um, we have hot summers here. Um, not as humid as Florida. I've been there multiple times, um, but we get 105 degree heat indexes up here. We just ensure that, um, and you'll want to do this as well, of having wallows, um, having a spot for them to go and lay and cool off wet mud. Um, we also run sprinklers out in our pens um, during the summer months. So we'll just have a rainbow arm sprinkler that goes back and forth. Um, I know a couple other manga farms uh, do that as well. So just to keep that cooling factor, and we we have a unique watering system where we took an IBC tote and we cut holes on the outside end of that. It's the big um, totes that some food producers use um, with liquids. Um, but we cut two squares off the side and we keep that, you know, bottom third of it filled with water. Well, then they, in the summertime, they use it like a car wash. They go in and out of there thinking it's a swimming pool and they cool off and then we have to drain it and clean it. So it's, you know, pigs are pigs. They'll, they'll lay in just about anything to cool off and, and get the mud. So as long as you have adequate water and shade and shelter for them um, in the high heat and humidity, they should be okay. Excellent. Well, I think we can keep going with the presentation. Other, I will note that some folks are interested in a deeper dive into some of the information that you shared so Yay! far. So we'll keep that in mind <laughs> for the future. Um, I just, we wanted to just kind of mention this briefly because I know um, people that raise other breeds, um, Carla can maybe talk a little bit about um, the red wattle, cause, um, she has those on her farm and breeds them with her mangas. Um, but the Mangalitsa, um, just recently established a breed organization in the United States. Um, there's been one over in Hungary, um, for quite some time, but it's, it's been a tricky process in the U S, um, just because of the way they came over here and kind of tracking and, a lot of just a lot of logistical challenges. Um, so it's um, you can 
go, they've got a, a great website um, and there's just a ton of great information in there. If you're also looking for just basics on um, starting the breed, if you're interested in um, getting going, Barbara um, does a fantastic job of what to consider when you want to raise this breed. Um, Cause there really are, they're, they're not, they're not definitely not a standard commercial hog. So that's one thing that if, I teach anybody is you cannot just put them in a four by four pen and raise them. That's just not going to happen with this breed. Um, but like I said, there is, there is an official breed organization um, for the Mangaleses in the U S now. Um, it's still kind of being worked on and tweaked, um, but it is in existence and there's lots of great resources on there um, from all aspects of raising the Mangaleza. So these are just some fun pictures that I had just extras of. Um, the one with all the fat in it, that is one of what I call my fat freezers. Um, a majority of what's in there is actually my lardo grade cuts for my, um, my fantastic Russian and Ukrainian customers that love that. Um, and that, yeah, he'll take half of that in a shot. It's just crazy how quickly they consume that and go through it. A um, couple other shots and there is a half of one that went in probably for one of my charcuterie customers um, before he had it cut. Um, and then just a couple of just shots of cute piglets and, and one of my blonde cells with her head in a pumpkin. <laughs> And then these are just some other shots. The one that garners a lot of attention, and it's funny because I didn't even know about this until a couple of years ago, is the whole Christmas tree thing. Um, <laughs> somebody had mentioned it, and I thought they were nuts. And it's, I don't know what it is, but it's its another great activity for your pigs in the winter. So after people discard their live Christmas trees, um, it is a little bit of a tricky process because um, A, you want to make sure that everyone gets all their stuff off the Christmas tree. Um, you don't want to, you want to make sure they're not like completely dead and brown when you get them. Cause otherwise they're just not going to be interested in them. Um, I've heard everything from people claiming their great worming control. I personally don't know anything about that, but honest to God in the dead of January, it's the best entertainment they've had in probably months with all the snow around. Um, but yeah, they just, they, they love winter. They just, they don't mind it. And they're just, yeah, they're great to do if you live in, in the Midwest or any place that gets any sort of cold or snow for any extended period of time. And that's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Um, let me just pull up my screen again. Oh my goodness, going back and forth. Um, if there are, we do have a, a couple minutes if folks do have, um, some other questions that you'd like to pose to um, Carla and Michelle. Um, actually, let me do this first. I'm going to put up a poll before folks um, before folks drop off. If you wouldn't mind taking just a moment while you're thinking of your questions to um, tell us what you learned um, while I get my other slides up. One moment, please. <laughs> okay. And then, let's see. Okay. Awesome. Sorry, there's so many things open on my computer. Okay. So let's see. Going back to the Q&A, we have a question. Um, do you cure your own meats in Larda? We do on a bit of a research and development platform. We don't sell it to the public. Um, a lot of it is just, it may possibly be sold to the public at some point. Um, the thing about lardo and a lot of curing is it takes time. Um, so it's not something you're going to be able to, for the most part, start now and it'll be ready in two weeks. Um, some of it you can, but a good majority of it is just takes good old fashioned time, which a lot of people don't have the patience for. So it's like we talked about, it's very much a niche market because of that. So if people understand, you know, and appreciate that, they will wait for it. Um, but it is, that's probably the one downfall of doing that is because it does take a lot of time. So good things come to those who wait. And believe me, if you've ever had any sort of charcuterie with this hog, you will, you'll just, you'll know it's incredible. 
Mm-hmm. It's kind of the, that we coined the term, once you go fat, you never go back. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the, the fact of like, even for us curing and doing our own lard, like we can't sell that to the public because it's a rule and regulation in Minnesota. So if I were to make all my own things here on my farm, I couldn't do that under like a cottage food or product of the farm. I have to have that inspected. So that's an even lard, there's shelf stability. If it's not frozen, um, then you get the FDA involved. So it's, it's quite a a process to, um, to get into that industry. And like Michelle, it's where we do a lot of R and D ourselves too. So we buy online, there's different kits that you can even get to make your own sausage where they send you the curing bag and the spices and the salts. And so we're doing some R and D with a couple of companies that offer that. And one of them's a Minnesota based company. Um, and then, you know, learning and getting educated from others that are in that industry. I know Michelle's gone to a couple classes out of state and, um, really learning from others on, you know, working with this product and kind of developing um, some new things in the industry like we did through our butcher. Um, They did some uh, new um, sausages for us for some of our customers. And so we did a Ukrainian blend, we did Polish sausage, we did um, an andouille, hot andouille, uh, chorizo. So we kind of got a little bit more research-based with our butcher to help them develop some recipes and a couple of them they're like oh well we're going to try this and put it in our own meat shop and they have um with their other pork products so um a little bit about some of that r&d is is, yeah you can absolutely do it for yourself um, for sure I kind of want to circle back to a question sorry Larissa if this was like out of order on your list but I wanted to make sure this got on there. Um, somebody had asked the question of how does this breed react to CO2 stunning? Um, this is something that is probably a good thing. I didn't actually, I guess our processor does captive bolt. So it never, I, to be honest, just learned what CO2 stunning is. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, but the mangalitsas, I have been told by my processor have, um, especially as they age, their bones are incredibly hard and their skull structure I don't think CO2 stunning is probably appropriate. Um, I was told that's much better suited for um, sheep and goats and um, animals with much smaller, obviously, head structures and probably not as. Once you see a mangalitsa skull, you're going to be floored. It's just they are incredibly, incredibly strong and just hard as concrete. Um, So I would probably stick with a processor that does captive bolt, to be honest, because that's what ours do. And we have great success success with it and they do wonderfully thanks for that yeah that those are there's a bunch of questions that folks have sent in on the registration form so carla and michelle um had access to those so um really good questions um someone's asking does feeding more forage such as alfalfa or hay decrease their fat and improve the amount and or improve the amount of meat I'm going to say no. Mm -hmm. Um, And the reason is it's more of a that vegetation. um, They need the protein, of course, but pure example, it's we we've done um, we've put in uh, Japanese millet for them um, to help with, you know, bedding in the winter. And then they also get some of that forage. But even like feeding them acorns, um, things of that nature, it, it's really not going to decrease the fat or improve the amount of meat. Speaking of like a tenderloin, a tenderloin on the mangalitsa is going to be about the third of a size than the tenderloin on even my purebred, purebred red wattle or other heritage breed hot. So it's, again, it's more fat-based than meat-based on this hog. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Michelle, but no, <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I'm, I'm spying the question that somebody had on the fixing the males and I desperately want to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sure. Why, we can move that to well, that just one because next. I'm, it's actually kind of shocking how many um, people that have raised these that kind of need to understand how quickly pigs can reproduce. Um, they, 
pigs gestate for almost roughly four months. So it's three weeks or three months, three weeks and three days. And most of the time they are on the spot. Somebody had asked if there's any opinion on fixing the males. Um, unless you are selling breeding stock, um, there really is no reason to keep an intact male out of a litter. Um, we actually, we do our, all our own castrations on site. Um, we do them at roughly two weeks. You would be shocked at how strong a piglet is at two weeks. Um, and I, people do them when they're older. I don't know how I couldn't, but, <laughs> um, cause they're very tricky to hold. Um, but if, like I said, unless you have any intent to breed, just fix them, the younger, the better it's easier. Um, the mangas are great because they heal incredibly quickly. Um, I remember the first time I did it, I thought they were all going to die. And <laughs> it was just, it was incredible how quickly they heal. Um, it's most people have a vet do it um, just because, but there are, I offer up the service. If people ever want to learn, I would happily come and teach you. Um, it's, it is super scary at first. I mean, it's not, it's, it's essentially surgery, but once you get the hang of it, it's actually very simple. And um, it's kind of nice just to have that um, control to do it yourself. So you don't always have to depend on a vet to do it. Um, so, and just always remember too, the longer you keep them intact, um, that male pig can get a female pig pregnant as young as five or six months. Um, I've heard some people say four, that may be pushing it, but either way, the lesson in this is they can reproduce at a very young age. Um, so you may think they're small, but an intact boar can get a female pregnant very, very young. Um, as far as the boar tank question, um, I've only experienced this once. Um, I've processed one boar and I actually kept all the meat myself because it was mainly a research project because I've heard both sides of the coin on this one where people say, oh my God, it's horrible, you can't eat it. And then some people say they don't notice it. Um, there's probably 8 million factors that will contribute to this. And I don't think there's one simple answer. Um, I think some of it is due to just individual variations in our own palate. I think some people can taste boar taint and others just can't. Um, I think some of it has to do with breed. Um, some of it has to do what you're feeding that breed. Um, so it can, there's really, it's not a black and white answer. It, it's more, it's much more complicated. Ours, I was actually, when we tasted the fat and the pork chops and from the boar that we processed, um, my husband actually liked it better, which I found kind of interesting. Um, I had other people tell me there was a different flavor, but it wasn't necessarily negative. Actually, I think Carla had a pork chop, so she said it was it just different. So it's mm -hmm. kind of, it's, I'm a food scientist by trade, so I could seriously spend probably an entire session talking about like sensory evaluation of how each of us as people can perceive, you know, the same item totally differently, so... Um, I'll kind of, there's a couple questions that pop up that kind of lead off of this. So um, one of them was, um, what age do you wean your pigs? Um, and then also going into issues with sows. Um, so we actually naturally wean our piglets. So we tend to keep ours with the mom um, until she starts pushing them away. Um, so some of ours are with her for about three months, um, and that's just to get them adequate growth. Again, they're slow growing. This hog is meant to be grown slow. They have so much fat and so many, like all that fat's wrapped around the cardiovascular system. So the longer we can keep them with mama, the better, the better quality of a hog that we have. Me personally, that's what I've noticed. Um, if we took them off too soon, we noticed that they would get sick um, or even like start bullying on each other. Um, the hogs are generally docile in nature. Um, there was one question, one statement on here about sows eating her piglets. Um, I have seen that happen, but not with healthy piglets. I've usually seen it if there's something wrong with the, with the, with the group of piglets born or otherwise it's probably time for that sow to go. Um, I know that sounds very harsh, um, but it's one of those things that if you have a sow eating piglets in general, 
it's not um, not a good contender for your farm to keep producing on a, on a profitability standpoint. It's a hard discussion to have those because we love these animals so much. Um, and I've had to go through that too. I Me had too. an instance. It happens. I had an instance where we had had her go after one and I just went, yeah, we're not doing that anymore. So, um, and then I can, I can go on to, there's another question about experience with planting forage. I'll be really quick about it. Um, this one, we actually work with our local uh, SWCD or NRCS office through the uh, USDA. Um, they work with us in replanting, we, replanting our paddocks. And with that, we put in forage such as um, radish and legumes uh, mixed in with some grass seed because we wanted more pasture for them um, and we wanted it to be able to translate even back to our cattle so we worked in conjunction with them on what to plant and they even had a, um, a no-till drill that they brought out and interceded our pastures with so i would highly recommend working with your local um, office or even extension service um, on a program like that that's yeah, that's really great information. I'll also just know. I that mentioned there... one more quick thing. Oh, go ahead. Just a, it's kind of a, just a general thing. Um, just about anybody who is thinking about doing this. Um, we do farm tours at our farm. Um, I often recommend if people are thinking about raising this breed, um, try the pork, find somebody who has it. I don't always have individual cuts in stock, but I do. Um, try the meat, see if you like it. Um, take home some fat, do, you know, just see what you're going to get out of it first. Um, and definitely if you're not sure about being a pharaoh to finish like Carla and I start with a couple of feeders, um, and even see if it's kind of something that you want to continue with. Um, <laughs> I I'm not going to lie. We got, we just went straight for the bang in the buck and did pharaohing right away. I don't know if I'd recommend that, but <laughs> you know, if, that's great if you want to, but just from a starting standpoint, find a farmer that's got it. I just, that's the easiest way to get started on this and then, you know, go from there. Awesome. That's really good advice. Yeah. Be practical with <laughs> before biting <laughs> off more than you can necessarily chew. I'll also note there are a couple comments in the, in the Q and A just about the Christmas trees. Um, someone saying that you might not want to give them to the pigs until they're ready to harvest. It might apparently might yes. change some of the meat flavor. So it's something. To, and and to I, I agree with that, Christina. <laughs> That's a good, excellent point. Good point. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think we got through most of, of, of um, the questions that came in really wonderful to have such um, great questions and that, you know, Carla and Michelle for, for being so open and um, accessible. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we sign off. Uh, I will be sending out a copy of I should say a link to the recording of this webinar and the slides are going to be posted on that uh, webinar landing page on our website and also on our on facts um, YouTube channel. So uh, look for an email in the next, well, hopefully by the end of the day, if not early tomorrow morning. Um, we have a couple more webinars coming up in April, and I'll be sure to inc include some links to those as well in my follow up email. So those are handy. Um, but yeah. Basically, I would really like to just say thank you so much, Carla and Michelle. It's really such a nice time to spend with you and honor and pleasure to have you for this nice, lively discussion and so much information being shared, um, a lot of interest as well. So that's something to keep in mind for future sessions. Um, thank you to everyone out in the audience for sticking around and for your interest and attention and um, in, in this topic and all the other ones that you've um, shared with us. Uh, I hope that everyone had a really good experience and that we're able to stay connected and keep in touch. So um, I think for now I'm going to sign off. Hope everyone has a great rest of their Wednesday and the rest of your week. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>